uh, let me start uh, by reminding you, uh, well, you and myself, perhaps, <laughs> where we were uh, um, the last time we saw each other, which feels like uh, a life ago. So, um, essentially, what we did was to construct uh, um, the so called KDV hierarchy, even though I didn't really mention the words in the last lecture. So, what we did was to study uh, equations, uh, which are KDV like equations. Uh, uh, of this type here that you see on the left. So there are uh, partial differential equations which are um, of first order in the time derivative and the time derivative of the field u, which is a function of x and t, is given by a function n uh, of u, uh, ux, uh, uxx, et cetera, with all its uh, special derivatives. And we saw that uh, at least for special types of uh, functions n of u and uh, uh, the special derivatives, uh, um, these uh, partial differential equations can be recast as a, a Lux equation, which is here on the right, um, where here we have a Lux pair. So there is a Lux operator L of u, which is a second derivative with respect to x plus u. And the time derivative of this Lux operator, uh, which is uh, simply ut, uh, because d is a special derivative which does not depend on time. So the left um, hand side of the equations on the right is the same as the left hand side as the equation on the left. So on the other hand, on the right hand side of the Lux equation, we have the commutator of uh, the two uh, operators in the Lux pair. So the Lux operator L of u and the second. Uh, a differential operator m of u, uh, which we can take to be uh, anti-Hermitian with respect to the uh, inner product on um, square integrable functions of x. Okay, and I remind you that uh, um, here when you think of this as differential operators, so uh, the derivative uh, uh, operator d is only with respect to x, so time t is uh, um, can be thought of as fixed. So. Uh, okay, so generically, when you have uh, the commutator of two uh, differential operators, that's another differential operator. But we saw that uh, uh, we can arrange the operator M uh, in such a way that this commutator really does not involve any uh, derivatives with respect to X. And we call such operators multiplicative uh, because all they do is to multiply whatever functions they act on by uh, uh, simply a function of U and uh, it's a uh, special derivatives, so without any differential operators left. So then the multiplicative operator, which is obtained here in the right-hand side of the Lux equation, should just multiply whatever functions it acts on by the function nm of u that we see on the left-hand side. So what we saw in the last lecture was that we can do this exercise systematically. So here M, uh, the subscript, uh, sorry, uh, small m, uh, was simply a subscript that labeled uh, differential operators of higher and higher degree. So we saw that uh, um, since the operator is uh, anti-Hermitian, we can take M to, be, uh, to involve only odd powers of the differential uh, D, the derivative with respect to X. So, uh, Say we can start. We started with the uh, uh, m equal one, and then the operator m one was trivial, and so the commutator uh, on the right hand side of the Lux equation was trivial, and uh, the partial differential equation was simply u t equal zero, which says that u uh, is only a function of x. So not very interesting uh, uh, result. But then we can increase the degree and say uh, for a small m equal to one, we found that. Um, the differential uh, operator M uh, has to be equal to uh, the derivative operator. And then the partial differential equation that you obtain here uh, is uh, the advection equation. So next we moved on uh, to uh, M equal to, so um, the second uh, operator in the Lux pair, M3 is now uh, of third order in the differential. And uh, uh, the partial differential equation that we obtained was uh, uh, the Lux equation that we, you see here on the right hand side. So uh, finally, we stopped there, but clearly uh, one can uh, uh, 
go on and uh, in one of the exercise uh, in the last homework uh, you had to do the exercise for a small m equal three and then uh, the operator uh, m4 is of uh, fifth degree and one obtains uh, a partial differential equation which is uh, uh, similar um, in some respects to the kdv equation in uh, uh, in the fact that it's nonlinear, and it also involves uh, a term, a linear term, which uh, now has uh, five derivatives uh, of u with respect to x, uh, uh, as opposed to the three derivatives that we had uh, uh, in the KDV equation. And clearly, this is systematic, so one can keep going and construct uh, uh, an infinite family uh, of uh, partial differential equations, uh, uh, of which uh, the KDV equation is just. Uh, uh, one member, and this is called the KDV hierarchy. Okay, so um, that's essentially the content of the last lecture. So uh, what I will do today is uh, to uh, try and explain how this uh, KDV hierarchy is uh, somehow surprisingly related to conservation laws. So uh, the next bit is uh, section 10.1. KDV hierarchy and conservation laws. So I will refer to material that we saw in the first term in chapter four. So it might be a good idea to uh, have a look again at that chapter if you understandably forgot uh, some of the content. But I, I'm going to recall uh, the relevant uh, information. So recall the following from, uh, from chapter four. We understood that, um, how conservation laws arise in equations like a KDV equation or the uh, Klein, uh, sorry, the sine Gordon equation. So in particular, we'll focus uh, on the KDV equation. And we saw that the KDV equation uh, admits uh, an infinite family so let me write an infinite sequence of uh, conserved uh, quantities or conserved charges So we use uh, Q for a conserved charge and the subscript N uh, labels uh, the charges in this infinite sequence. So they're given by integrals over space X from minus to plus infinity of uh, charge density rho N. So this is equation 10.18. The charge density rho n satisfies uh, uh, the continuity equation, so d rho by dt, d rho n by dt plus d j, j n by the x equal to zero. This equation 10.19. Current Jn. So rho again is called the charge density and Jn is called the current. And this current uh, should satisfy the condition that uh, Jn essentially takes the same values at uh, minus and plus infinity. So when this happens, when we have the um, continuity equation and this uh, and the boundary conditions uh, also imply 10.20 for the currents, then we saw that it's trivial to see uh, that the time derivative of uh, the conserved charge Qn is uh, equal to zero. So in the context of the KDV equation, we also we constructed the uh, explicit or we provided a general method to construct uh, um, systematically the conserved charges. And they were such that uh, 
the charge density rho n started as u to the n and then it had uh, more terms that were necessary in order for rho to uh, obey a continuity equation so that's equation 10.21 and in particular, so uh, at the beginning, we constructed the first few conserved charges by hand, but that uh, gets quite uh, cumbersome and boring. But later on, I explained this uh, method called the Gardner transform that allows you to construct uh, all these infinite, uh, infinitely many conserved charges systematically. So uh, eventually we could obtain this infinite sequence of conserved charges by means of the Gardner transform. Okay, now, just to be a bit more explicit, let me write down uh, what the first few charge densities were. So rho one uh, was equal to u, rho two was equal to u squared, rho three was equal to u cubed minus one half ux squared, rho 4 was equal to u to the fourth power minus 2u ux squared plus a fifth uxx squared and so on and so forth and we saw that uh, uh, the charge density q1 which is the integral over space over rho 1 was the mass of the kdv wave uh, Q2, which is the integral of rho 2, was a horizontal momentum of the wave. Q3, which is the integral of rho 3, uh, was the energy of the wave. So these three conserved charges uh, um, are standard conserved charges, which uh, uh, we normally expect. So they do not come as a surprise, but uh, in addition, there are infinitely many more uh, non-trivial conserved charges starting from uh, Q4 uh, and onwards, which are uh, not obvious. And it did, uh, it was a surprise uh, uh, when uh, Gardner, Kruskal uh, and Mura constructed, uh, and then uh, uh, Gardner alone constructed all these uh, infinitely many extra conserved charges. Okay, so, Going back to what we saw in the previous lecture, uh, which so far seems to be slightly unrelated to what I've just reminded you of uh, in the context of conservation laws. So we seem to have uh, two infinite sequences. So one sequence is the one that I'm discussing now. So uh, we are studying the KDV equation and there is an infinite sequence uh, of conserved charges Qn. Of you. I will uh, uh, explain the notation uh, with square brackets of u later. Right now, let's just think of them as uh, qn, which are the integrals of uh, rho n uh, written above. So that's one infinite sequence. Uh, on the other hand, if we think of uh, what we did uh, until the previous lectures and uh, what I reviewed at the beginning of this video, uh, we saw that we can go beyond the, the KDV equation. And we have uh, an infinite sequence of functions uh, n, n of uh, 
U and uh, uh, its special derivatives, uh, or correspondingly of a multiplicative operator, such that uh, the time evolution uh, governed by the partial differential equation ut equal n n of u, or equivalently its associated uh, Lux equation, leaves uh, the eigenvalues of the Lux operator L of u, which is second x derivative plus uh, u, constant in time. That was a crucial uh, uh, property uh, that the uh, Lux equation uh, bought us. Okay, so at first sight, uh, these two infinite sequences uh, uh, don't seem to have uh, anything to do with one another. One has to do with the uh, uh, conserved charges in a fixed equation, the KDV equation in this infinite hierarchy. And the second one uh, uh, is an infinite sequence of different uh, uh, equations, which can all be recast, uh, different partial differential equations, which can all be recast uh, as a Lux uh, equation. Uh, but surprisingly, the two sequences are related. So surprisingly, the two sequences are related. And that's what we're going to see next. Uh, but to understand how, I will have to introduce uh, a new concept. Which is uh, uh, that of a functional derivative. So this is a concept that uh, fourth year students who have uh, already looked at uh, the extra reading material uh, will have uh, encountered in uh, for slightly different reasons that I will mention uh, later on, but uh, uh, I'm gonna explain uh, next uh, what the functional derivative uh, is uh, uh, so that everyone is on board. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the next part. 10.1.1, which is the functional derivative. So we'll first define this object, the functional derivative, and then later on we'll see how this allows us to relate to infinite sequences that I've described above. Okay, so this is a, a rather important concept that you might have encountered in other courses, especially if you um, studied the calculus of variations um, and it has many uses. Uh, um, so but let's first introduce what it is. So for now, we'll uh, be interested in functionals f of uh, square brackets of u, which are defined as integrals. So we think of u as a function of x. So in particular, u could be our KDV field and uh, uh, then it would be a function of x uh, and t time, but we keep time fixed uh, and I will not, uh, uh, I will suppress uh, time from the notation. So we just think of uh, uh, u right now as a function of x at fixed time. And it's given by an integral over x of uh, a function uh, um, small f of u and its special derivatives ux, uxx, uh, etc. This equation 10.23. So this is an example of a functional
of u. So what does functional means? Uh, it means that it maps uh, a function u of x to a number. f of u, uh, which in our case will be some real number. Okay, so u of x uh, is a real function of variable x and the functional uh, f of u is just a number. So the input is a function and the output uh, is a number. Okay, so um, Next, I want to introduce the notion of a functional derivative. And as usual, when we uh, study derivatives, we want to take uh, small variations of the object uh, that we're interested in. Uh, but right now, um, the object that the functional uh, depends on is uh, a function u. So we will consider a small variation uh, delta u of uh, our function u. Oh, sorry, I should keep this uh, readable. So let's now consider a small variation delta u of x. And again, if uh, uh, u also depends on t, as is the case uh, for the KDV field, that t is suppressed. And we consider this uh, small variation such that uh, um, delta u and also its uh, special derivatives uh, go to zero at the endpoints uh, of the um, of the range of x so uh, for us they will go to zero as x goes to plus and minus infinity so then we can consider the functional f evaluated the on u plus the small variation delta u. So by definition, using equation 10.23, this will be again an integral over space of f of uh, u plus delta u instead of u. And then instead of ux, we'll have the x derivative of u plus delta u. Instead of uh, the second derivative of u, we'll have the second derivative of u plus delta u. and so on. So next I'm going to write this as uh, in the following form, which at first sight uh, might be either, uh, might either look confusing or trivial. So, uh, okay, I will first write u plus delta u as it is. Then uh, I'll write uh, the derivative, uh, the x derivative of u plus uh, uh, its small variation as uh, the first derivative of u plus the variation of the first derivative of u. So uh, what this is telling us is delta u x uh, is just equal to delta u all differentiated with respect to x. So the small variation and the derivatives commute essentially by definition. And similarly, uh, the second derivative of u plus uh, uh, its small variation is uh, the second derivative of u plus the second derivative, of, sorry, plus the small variation of the second derivative of u, which is the second derivative of the small variation, and so on for um, higher special derivatives if they are there. Okay, so um, we're trying to evaluate uh, the functional uh, after changing u by a small variation, and this is what we found. So uh, we're assuming that the small variation and its derivatives uh, are all small. And so we can now tailor expand uh, um, the last expression by uh, assuming that delta u, delta ux, delta ux, xx are small. So let's do that. Um, okay, so now we we're going to tailor expand uh, to first order 
in delta u uh, and uh, its uh, special derivatives. So um, the zeroth order term would just be the integral of dx f of u ux uxx. So that's what uh, we define to be the functional f of u. So this is zeroth order. And then uh, the first order term comes from taking uh, uh, first partial derivatives of small f inside the integrand. So we have integral dx from minus infinity to plus infinity, uh, partial of f with respect of u times delta u, plus partial of f with respect to ux times delta ux plus partial of f with respect of uxx times delta uxx, etc. Okay, so this is first order. And then we're neglecting terms which are quadratic uh, in the fluctuation delta u. And here by this, I mean quadratic in uh, delta u or delta ux, delta uxxx, etc. Okay. So next, um, we remember that what I saw earlier, that uh, what I said earlier is that the, the variation of the first derivative of u, so delta u x x, delta u x is nothing but the x derivative of delta u, similar delta u x x is, uh, the second derivative of delta u, etc. So um, at this point, we can integrate by parts the partial, uh, so and move the partial derivatives uh, from the variation delta u um, onto the terms that they multiply. So we'll integrate by parts. So we still have f of u and then the integration by parts, we move all the derivatives from uh, delta u uh, onto the terms that they multiply. So I'll factor out delta u and that will multiply partial of f with respect to u. That's for the first term there. And then for the next term, we'll have to integrate by parts one. So we'll get minus derivative with respect to x of partial of f with respect of ux. For the third term, we'll have to integrate by parts twice, so we get plus second derivative with respect to x square of partial of f with respect of uxx, uh, etc. Plus uh, second order. So, and now we define uh, the functional derivative. Of capital F with respect to U and we denote it uh, by using deltas instead of uh, partial symbols. Uh, and we define the functional derivative as follows by um, looking at the variation of the functional. So we take f of u plus delta u minus f of u. So this is how the functional varies when we vary the function uh, uh, u, which is its input by delta u. So we need to take the difference uh, of the left hand side and the right hand side. So that's just given by, oops, what is happening? the integral uh, that I've wrote, written there to first order the integral dx delta u of delta f. Sorry, so let me define the functional derivative. So um, the small variation of the functional is given by the integral uh, in dx of the functional derivative of capital F with respect to U times the very uh, infinitesimal variation of U. And this would be what we call the infinitesimal variation of the functional capital F of U to a linear order 
plus uh, uh, higher order terms that uh, we will neglect. Okay, so this is the definition of a functional derivative. So whenever you take, uh, you have a functional f, which is given by an integral uh, um, over x, then uh, uh, this defines uh, the functional derivative uh, uh, for us. So now if I compare with the last line uh, in the previous equation, 10.24, we can deduce what the functional derivative is. So the functional derivative of capital F with respect to U is given by the uh, quantity in the square brackets uh, above. So it's partial of F with respect to U minus the derivative with respect to X of so partial of F with respect to U X plus second derivative with respect to X of uh, partial of F with respect to U X X and so on and so forth. This equation 10.26. So, as an aside, uh, as I written uh, uh, as a comment in the notes, so this concept of functional derivative, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's really central in classical physics, and there, in particular, an important functional uh, uh, that you have uh, is uh, the action which is given as an integral over space and time of uh, so-called Lagrangian density. And then we can obtain uh, uh, equations of motion that uh, could be Newton's equations or uh, the sine gordon equation or the KDV equation, depending on the context, by imposing that uh, the functional derivative of this action uh, vanishes. So anyway, this was probably uh, a, little bit, uh, a little abstract. So let me just give you uh, a few examples. So now we'll only use uh, equation 10.26, which gives us a formula for the function, functional derivative. So let's look at a few examples. So we will always consider functionals, capital F of U, which are given by integral over X of a function uh, uh, small f of u and its derivatives. And let's consider a few examples. So the simplest example would be if small f is just equal to u. So then uh, the functional derivative uh, using the formula above is given by the derivative, partial derivative of f with respect to u, which is one. And then all the other terms vanish because uh, the uh, f in this case does not depend on derivatives of u. On the other hand, say if uh, f were equal to say u to the fourth, then uh, the functional derivative will involve this partial derivative of a uh, small f with respect to u, that's for u cubed. And again, there are no extra terms because there are no uh, special derivatives. Uh, so ux, uxx, etc., do not appear in small f. Uh, on the other hand, say if small f is ux squared and the partial derivative of capital F with respect to u uh, is as follows. So now the first term, the partial derivative of f with respect to u uh, is zero. But now we have the second term, so we have minus derivative with respect to x of partial of f with respect to ux, which is equal to 2ux. So in this case, the partial derivative would be minus 2uxx, and so on and so forth. OK, so now let me move on to the next page. So now, uh, as you can probably see, the conserved charges that I uh, that we studied in the first term and that I reminded you of earlier can be thought of as functionals of U. So the conserved charges Q n 
a really functional of u. That's why I use a square brackets here because they're given by integral over x of uh, charge densities rho n, which are really functions of u, ux, ux, x, etc. So these are examples of functionals of the type uh, 10.23. And so in particular, let's compute their functional derivatives uh, since uh, we'll see uh, in a few minutes that this is useful. So their functional derivatives are as follows. So, and I'm looking at the conserved charges for KdV. So for rho one, in the case in which the conserved charge was mass, so rho one was equal to u and so the functional derivative of Q with respect to U is one as we computed above. So rho two was equal to U squared and then Q two was uh, the momentum and now the functional derivative of Q two is therefore equal to two U. So for rho three, which is slightly more complicated. So that was U cubed minus a half U X squared then Q3 was uh, um, the energy. And now since we have terms uh, involving U and also a term involving UX, we'll have to uh, consider two terms in the general formula for the functional derivative. So first, uh, um, for the term that depends only on U, let me remind you again. Of the general formula 10.26. So first we have to take partial of uh, the integrand with respect to u. So that would be 3 u squared. But next for the term which uh, depends on ux we have to take minus the partial derivative with respect to x of uh, the partial of f with respect to ux. So we have minus partial with respect to x of uh, uh, the partial derivative of minus a half ux squared with respect to ux, which is minus ux. So that's 3u squared plus uxx. So next, the first non trivial uh, or unexpected uh, charge is u to the fourth minus 2 uux squared plus a fifth u x x squared. And now I will leave this uh, as an exercise. So please uh, use the general formula 10.26 that we derived earlier. And you should be able to check that uh, the final result for this functional derivative is for u cubed plus two ux squared plus 4u uxx plus 2 over 5 fourth derivative of u. Hopefully uh, the computation I did is correct. If you found a mistake, let me know. Okay, so now we have a uh, uh, so we realize that the conserved charges uh, for the KDV equation are functionals uh, and we computed their functional derivatives. So um, that's certainly an exercise that we can do, but uh, why is this useful? Well, it is useful because uh, now I can make the general claim that relates the two infinite sequences. So the general claim is as follows. So the two infinite sequences, so the uh, one sequence was a, a sequence of uh, different partial differential equations, the so-called KDV hierarchy. And the other sequence was a sequence uh, uh, of conserved charges in a fixed equation in this hierarchy, which was uh, the KDV equation. And now I'm claiming that the two infinite sequences uh, are related uh, as follows. Uh, 
using the notion of a functional derivative that I introduced above. So the nth type, uh, so the nth KDV type equation, so ut equal capital N of small n of u. which I call nth KDV-like uh, equation. So the claim is that this is equivalent to the following equation that partial derivative of ut, sorry, is equal to partial with respect to x of the functional derivative of the nth charge qn With respect to you. So we're here again, QN is the nth conserved charge uh, in a standard KDV equation. So the claim is that once you know all the conserved charges uh, in the standard KDV equation, then you can construct uh, all the other uh, equations in the KDV hierarchy by taking a partial derivative, sorry, functional derivative of this conserved charge, and then uh, it's a partial derivative with respect to x, and that will give you um, the function n of u and its special derivative that appears on the right-hand side of the KDV-like uh, equation. Um, in uh, the nth member of the KDV uh, hierarchy. Okay, so um, I should stress here that this is up to normalization. So when I define the, the multiplicative operators of the, or the functions n, n of u, and when I define the conserved charges in the KDV equation, I wasn't careful in uh, making all com uh, the two normalizations consistent. So actually, uh, in this equivalent, this, this is up to normalization, meaning that you can normalize either the charges or uh, the functions n, n of u and uh, its uh, derivatives uh, uh, appropriately to make sure that the two sequences uh, are related as in 10.28. Okay, so uh, next I'm gonna make two more comments. Uh, which uh, I, I will just make, uh, uh, I will just claim a, a couple of results without really uh, deriving them. So the first comment is that, uh, so we have the, we had the conserved charges in the standard KDV equation, and then we had this uh, infinite family of uh, equations, uh, the KDV hierarchy of, of which the KDV equation was just one example. And so the first comment is that actually for each element, for each equation in the KDV hierarchy, then all the charges QN of U are conserved. So all the charges QN of U, where N uh, runs from one to infinity are conserved. Uh, where here, these are the charges that uh, we derived for the KDV. So the same charges are conserved if U evolves according to any um, of the equations in the KDV hierarchy. So there are two statements here. So one is that the, each uh, equation in the KDV hierarchy uh, admits infinitely many conserved uh, charges, so infinitely many conservation laws. But not just that, it's that the, uh, the same uh, uh, conservation laws apply uh, 
uh, to each equation in the KDV hierarchy. So these charges Qn of u are the same for all the equations in the hierarchy. And the second uh, statement that I'm going to make is uh, actually related uh, to the previous one, is that uh, in the KDV equation, we have one uh, uh, spatial variable x and one time variable t. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's possible to introduce a different uh, time variable for each equation in the KDV hierarchy. So one can introduce a different time for each equation uh, in the hierarchy. And in fact, uh, we can package uh, uh, the whole uh, hierarchy into a single function uh, u of space and uh, uh, a time variable for each element in the hierarchy, so t1, t2, etc. So now we have infinitely many time variables, one for each element of the original hierarchy, such that uh, the partial derivative of u with respect to, say, the mth time variable is equal to the uh, mth function n m of u and its special derivatives, which is uh, again up to normalization, partial of x with respect to the functional derivative of the nth conserved charge with respect to u. So this holds for every m from one to infinity. So we have a, a, a single, say, um, parent field u, which is a function of x and infinitely many times. And then we can evolve this field in uh, uh, each of these uh, uh, time variables uh, separately. And in particular, if we evolve u in, uh, uh, if we evolve u uh, for a while uh, in uh, the i time say in time ti and then uh, for another while in time tj okay. uh, we get the same result as if we evolved uh, in the opposite order. So this is, leads to the idea of so-called commuting flows. So the time evolution with respect to the i time commutes with the time evolution with respect to uh, the j time for any uh, I and J. And this is, turns out to be a very far reaching idea. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to uh, explore further. But essentially, here uh, you can see that uh, the time uh, evolutions commute, uh, roughly speaking, because the equations uh, uh, which give us uh, the time evolution with respect to different times are uh, decoupled. Okay, so the idea here is that if you start from uh, some uh, initial uh, a value of u, and then we evolve the uh, by time, say, t1, and then we evolve by time t2, then we get the same as if we first evolve by delta t2, and then evolve by delta t1. 
So as I said, this is really a, a, an important context uh, concept, but unfortunately, I'll just leave it here um, as a comment uh, because we don't have time to explore it further. Okay, so I'll stop here for today. I'll just mention that uh, uh, there is an extra comment which uh, 4H uh, students who have seen the extra reading material might want to read. So in particular, uh, in the notes, uh, uh, you can see um, how the KDV equation, and in fact, any equation in the KDV hierarchy can be obtained from an action by using uh, uh, the variational principle or by setting to zero the functional derivative of the action that we um, defined above. <laughs>